Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Araceli Garcia, and I have been an ELA teacher for about 25 years. I recently left the classroom and serve as a teacher on special assignments supporting ELA teachers in the middle school and high schools. Uh, I have been doing a series of workshops, and this past week we had a workshop on innovative and engaging reading strategies. So we're going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and just do a little short recap of what we talked about and some of the strategies and tools that we shared. Okay, so let me just get on to this slide here. And uh, this PowerPoint or this Google slide presentation that I'm going to share here, I am also going to make available uh, if you go under the descriptions of this YouTube link so that you can have access to all the resources that I talk about. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about reading, right? And so for this session, uh, what we covered is a little bit of research, a little bit of data, especially some school data that I will share only with the, the individual schools, and then uh, some of the challenges that we're facing. And finally, we'll end with those strategies that might help and can help a lot of your students. So again, as a teacher for many years, uh, reading has been a challenge even way before the pandemic and way before the distance learning. Our students sometimes find a lot of the reading boring. They don't kind of connect to it. They don't find it relevant to their lives, uh, especially when you're uh, now working with those young teenagers who have so many distractions. So let's take a look at this research and I will read just some of it out to you. And again, this is from 2018. Again, I think it probably has gotten worse uh, over the past couple of years. So take a look at what this researcher says. It says, think about how difficult it must be to read even five pages of an 800 page college textbook when you've been used to spending most of your time switching between one digital activity and another in a matter of seconds. It really highlights the challenges students and faculty both face in the current era. So this is true, not just in the middle schools and high schools, but all the way into the college level courses where students again are on that cell phone, interactive constantly, and here they are given maybe a novel to read or long passages and their brain just almost hurts them to be able to do that. And so we want to basically scaffold and build that skill of stamina and reading with our students. Uh, let's look at another research here. And what I had the participants do uh, when they were in my workshop is we use the, one of the tools I'm gonna be talking about, which is Pear Deck. I love Pear Deck and it can really help your students interact with the text so that they feel a lot more engaged. And so what I had the participants do, the teachers who attended this workshop is we, as we were reading, they were highlighting using that Pear Deck tool and they're also able to use Immersive Reader. And I'm gonna show you this in a moment. All right, but just a little bit more about uh, some research here, another article. And, and again, remember when you get this uh, slide, you'll have all these hyperlinks you can go to. It says that uh, the national tests tell the story of a decade of progress. So we have been making some progress, followed by a decade of inequality and then the shock of the pandemic, which came with a one-two punch. He estimates that losing one point on the national exam roughly translates to about three weeks of learning. That means that top performing students lost three points in math could catch up in as little as nine weeks, while a low performing student who lost 12 points would need 36 weeks or almost nine months to make up ground and would still be significantly behind more advanced peers. So this is important because a lot of teachers are feeling very frustrated at the gap that they're seeing in their classrooms. They have students who are high performing, advanced, and in the same classroom sitting there in your class of 30, 35, who knows, 40, right? Um, kids are really behind. And so somebody asked like, how do I even teach with such a great gap? And the message I have to say to a lot of teachers is, you can't punish kids for things that were out of their control. I know that when I was teaching distance learning, I had my seniors, my AP seniors, who had a little brother, little sister in their lap, trying to manage other siblings as they were trying to take their own classes. Some of my students had to work full time because their parents could not find work or were unemployed during uh, the pandemic, during this distance learning. And of course, sadly, I have students who lost parents and family members during these times of crisis. Our students are still feeling the effects of this horrific, horrific pandemic. And they may be given up. They feel like they are so far behind that there's no way they're gonna catch up on it with their peers. It is our job to welcome them and make them feel safe. And that learning 
it is a journey. It's not a destination, right? And so we have to make sure our students feel that learning is important in their lives uh, rather than, you know, constantly harping on they didn't do the homework, they don't know how to write the essay, they didn't do the reading. Instead, let's find out why. Why aren't they getting these things done? Have those one-on-ones, talk to, find out what's going on at home. And that way you can then take those next steps. That's my message to you. All right. Well, let's talk about the kids that are sitting in our classroom. I've shown this uh, slide before in my previous video, but I just think it's such an important um, aspect of our, our classroom. We have to know who are our students sitting in the classroom. And so here, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. You could pause the video and read it on your own. But our students of today, I'm just gonna highlight a few. They're social, they like to interact. They're constantly sharing videos and memes and text messages, right, nonstop on their cell phone. They're multitaskers. They, they don't like to do one thing for a very long period of time. And that might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing, right? But we can use that to our advantage in the classroom. They, again, uh, you know, educated, they can go down these rabbit holes of research when it's a topic that really calls to them. Let's provide that space for them to do that. Uh, again, they are our IT personnel in our classrooms. These kids can figure out and troubleshoot any kind of tech issue we might be having. Let's honor that talent, right? Uh, they're interactive, tech savvy. Yes, we know they're less focused, but let's be honest. I think as a society, we are less focused. Um, and they're also cautious. They're uh, very aware. Of, of not wanting to make mistakes sometimes, of maybe the pressure to be perfect, especially as they live in this social media world where everyone seems to have a perfect life. And, and, and our students are hesitant to speak up, hesitant to make a mistake, uh, hesitant to, to take a risk. And so again, we as teachers can create that environment that is a safe, but a courageous environment, an environment where we are going to push them to take that risk, to try something new, and to get their voices out there. All right, let's keep going. I did share uh, this, uh, again, some data that you can find, uh, and uh, I found this through uh, DataQuest. Uh, it is, you know, if you Google it, you can find DataQuest and gives you a lot of this information. And so let's just take a look here. This is, again, from 2018-19, prior to the pandemic, where we as a state of California, where were we at? And as you can see here, that's not very good, right? 57% about uh, our, our students are, are scoring at met or exceeded in their ELA standard. Now, I, I always emphasize this to, whenever I talk to schools and teachers, ELA, uh, Common Core Standards, is not just the responsibility of ELA teachers. This is a literacy skill that should be across the curriculum. So, you know, we should be uh, inviting and having conversations with all of our colleagues to see how can we support literacy in all classrooms, um, whether it's through, um, you know, again, reading strategies, some writing frames, a lot of speaking in those classes. And, and again, so this is an important data to look at. All right, so what else are we finding? Some of the research, again, in the and tips, strategies that maybe you've already heard of and, and uh, already know because you've experienced it. So number one, so if our students are struggling, to read long works, you want to start short, right? So again, think about uh, running a marathon. You're not going to run a marathon when you haven't even practiced, or you're going to you're going to give up. And so let's start with short goals. Um, maybe yeah, maybe in my class I have a kid who's an avid reader. And yes, you go, kid. You're going to read that whole novel, and right, you're going to get uh, you know this extra maybe extra credit, or maybe you're going to be the presenter for something. But this kid over here who's struggling, who's my English learner, or maybe has uh, some special needs, I might just give them a few chapters. They're both still learning, all right? I always think of it like workout. When I go to the gym or, you know, you go work out, uh, not everyone's doing the same thing. Not everyone's working at the same rate, yet everyone, <laughs> you know, again, uh, is there to, to sweat and, and to uh, work on themselves. And our classroom should be like that, a little bit more individualized to the needs of our students. What else? Um, try different uh, strategies. Uh, again, as we know, our students like variety and change. So use online tools, use uh, some graphic organizers. Number two, number three, 
let kids choose. I love doing choice boards, right? Maybe I give them two, three choices. Hey, you can do this, this, and this. Um, products don't always have to be the same. Uh, again, find out what they're really interested in. If they love uh, music, maybe they get to choose a song that they can analyze. Uh, if they are tech savvy, maybe they get to make a, a blog rather than a by paragraph essay on a, on a piece of paper. So again, some of these I'm gonna share at the end with, with other ways that you can have them produce uh, some of the you know, tasks that you have to have them do. Give frequent and focused feedback. And I'm not just talking about the red pen and marking everything that's wrong. Catch them when they're doing the things you want them to do. One of the best classroom management tips I always give teachers is that kid, you know, that kid, that uh, is maybe has some issues in the class, who's reluctant, who maybe is even a little bit defiant, who is not doing the work, who puts his head down, who doesn't do the work. That one thing he does well, call home on that weekend. I tell the kid, hey, you did awesome. I love how you annotated that. You know what, you're, you're work doing really well. Can I call your parents, your guardians this weekend? And I'll call on a Friday. And the kid just lights up like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah that would be great. And so I call and even the parents are sometimes shocked, like, what, you're calling me because my kid is doing something good, right? Yes, they need that. Those are the kids that need it the most, that recognition, right? Because they're going to want attention somewhere or another. And I'd rather give them attention to the good things that they're doing. All right, what else do we have? Spark new learning, tap into their curiosities. Uh, again, some of the works that we're teaching have been works that have been in our book room for almost 20, 30 years. Our students might not see themselves in those works. Yes, I'm not saying, you know, um, uh, I'm not saying to get rid of, of some of the classics. Some of these are great works. However, can we parallel them with something newer? Uh, can we have them do research on how it connects to, to nowadays? Think of, again, uh, the, the witch hunts, right? The crucible, a classic. How are we still having witch hunts today? where there's a topic, right, uh, of, again, um, you know, COVID or some of the politics that are going on. Let them make those connections. Uh, and, and that goes into number six, right? As it says here, there's a famous quote, uh, author who says, books should be windows, right? They should be mirrors and they should be sliding glass doors where they can see themselves in that story, in and out. Many times, especially in, in populations of students of color, we're not providing works where they can see themselves. Or the, some of the works that we teach see some of our, our special students of color as victims, right? Um, and, and we don't wanna present that. We wanna present a rich variety of different perspectives. Uh, number seven and eight, use all kinds of different texts at your hand. Our students and our society is asking them to be uh, able to read media and to read uh, not just the written word, right? sometimes when kids are sending those memes, I don't even understand them, but they can decipher exactly what it means. And so again, podcasts, audiobooks, right? Get them up and moving and have them act out scenes, right? Graphic novels are great for many of our students. So choices is going to be a, a big, big thing. All right, let's keep going. So one of the programs that I love using is Pear Deck. And so what I did here is I was showing the teachers that you can take a reading from the, the program that we have, our curriculum, which is Study Sync, copy and paste a passage. And so I like to chunk the reading for my students. I'm not giving them an entire, you know, pages and pages of reading, and then they're just gonna annot uh, annotate and answer questions at the end. Uh, those are those think questions. I'm gonna change it up. I'm gonna just do short passages. We're gonna highlight some things. So maybe I'm doing a lesson on imagery, and I'm gonna have students highlight it, but I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna switch over to Pear Deck and show you how this works in a moment. And what happens is I, as a teacher, have a dashboard. And as I gave them that, that assignment, I can see all of my students' work in real time. So I'm not waiting for them to turn the assignment and figure out which kid just is not doing it, is not understanding it. I am doing it in the classroom. I am able to scroll down and see which students have not answered. I can leave some comments or I can just walk over to the students and say, hey, that's a great answer. Don't forget to capitalize, you know, that first uh, word there. So lots, as you can see here, I might have had students to summarize. If I, I only speak for about five, 10 minutes, that's usually my lecture time. 
five, 10 minutes of a little quick lecture, and then we turn it over to them, summarize, dialogue, think, pair, share, then I bring it back. It is a constant, you know, catch game, back and forth. It is not me talking for an extended amount of time or them sitting and reading for a while. I don't even put on an audio and let it play for an extended amount of time. It has to be interactive. All right, what else do I see? So on Pear Deck, this is what I would see from my students. I could see an individual. So the student's name would be here. And these are the directions I told my students. I wanted them to read a sample essay. I wanted them to uh, circle the, these, the verbs and the thesis, as you can see here, right? And to highlight in different colors. So these are all tasks you can do using this Pear Deck program. And here again, if I put it on different uh, grid view, I can see all of my students, all of my students uh, doing all of their work. And I could see if anyone's, you know, not getting the right verbs, not highlighting the correct things. Um, again, this is great for your EL students. We talk about designated ELD time in your classes. We need to make sure the students are getting language support. This would be a great way because now I can see if there's any common errors and stop the class and do a quick little right, a quick little lesson, maybe on subject verb agreement. Maybe I pull a small group to the side and say, okay, I'm noticing that you're having this kind of issue and work with that. Or I can leave them even a comment using this comment um, button here. All right. One of my, one of the teachers in our district uh, wrote how they use Paradig in their U.S. history class and how the, the chunk, you know, he chunked the text and students were able to also do this in ethnic studies. They said that they really like completing a required reading that way. And this is from one of our schools. It's an alternative high school for students who didn't succeed possibly in the traditional schools. Here they are trying to get their credits and this teacher's finding a way to make sure that, that they are interacting and being successful. All right, so how do you get to Pear Deck? So if you Google just this site, right, Pear Deck, and you go to teacher login. Now, if you're in our, our district, Hacienda La Puente Unified, you already have um, access to this. You have the premium access. So you would just click on login and use your school email. And that'll get you right into this uh, session here. And as you can see here, there are uh, slides that you can create from this site, right? And you could either use Google Slides or you can create PowerPoint, uh, either one. There's also this great uh, fun place over here with making flashcards. This is awesome. Um, I think I'm going to do another video on this one because instead of having students do physical flashcards, right, in the traditional way, this is a much more uh, interactive way. And again, uh, highly engaging because they get to draw their own pictures and share with partners. Uh, and then you could check them to see if they're, they're done correctly. So great, great stuff right here with this uh, flashcard factory. Uh, there's also lots of already made uh, slides uh, with interactive slides that you can use from their library, but I usually have my own sessions here that I've created. Okay, so again, how would you set this up is you actually first would open, let's say, any Google presentation that you already have. So you've already created all this work. Maybe you copied a passage, like I said, from your curriculum. Maybe you took a picture of a, you know, page in a textbook and uploaded it as a PDF. And now you have your Google Slides. So here are all my Google Slides, right? And all I'm gonna do is go to add-ons and I'm gonna add Pear Deck. Now you only have to do this once because once you've added it and installed it, then it'll automatically show up here as it does, from, it does for me. And then I would just open it. So when I open it, it's going to look like this. And now I have some choices. I can either use the already made templates that Pear Deck has, and it includes things like SEL, a little bit social emotional, um, you know, quick questions like how stressed are you, um, you know, what's a concern you have, things like that. Or uh, they have other ones such as some um, graphic organizers, open brain, uh, Venn diagrams, KWL charts, all kinds of great, great stuff. Or if I don't want to use that template, if I go down here and click on any of these, I can make any of these slides clickable and they are also, uh, again, interactive slides. So I can have students write a little summary of text, right? So this ABC one is a text uh, option. I can ask some multiple choice questions or take a poll. Uh, I can, this one is great, the draw one, because I can have my students highlight 
circle underline and also type, uh, type on the page that I want them to type right or I can again use this one and that's kind of a, like a ranking type of option what else um so so that's the one you know that's one of the ones this next slide is a different program but I'm going to just kind of stay here talking about Pear Deck so let me switch over and show you uh what this looks like so I'm going to go over to let's pretend here's my uh, a presentation I'm doing. So I teach seniors, ERWC, I've already made my slides. I'm gonna start off with my learning target. I want them to, you know, it's the first day. So I want them to fill out a little note card of information. Then I'm gonna go over some of my policies. And then I want them to work on a, who am I poem. And so I have this kind of fill in the blank, right? Okay, how do I pair deck this? So again, I'm gonna go to add on. I'm gonna go ahead and open that add on. I'm going to move my slide here. Okay. Mm -hmm. There it is. Okay, add on. And I'm going to go over here. And so now I'm going to, I'm going to get some choices. Okay. And I always like to start my lessons with a little bit of just checking in, a little SEL. So I'm going to go to the templates. And I'm going to go to, let me just show you again some of the SEL social emotional stuff. I'm just going to ask, you know, maybe I want them to calm down and you know, play some nice calm music while they come in. Uh, I like this one, what's filling your bucket. I like this one. So I'm going to just click it and it automatically gets sent to my Google Slides. And what happens is now I'm telling my students, okay, you know, what's bringing you joy? What's getting you excited? And then, oh, what's stressing you out? What gives you a little bit of anxiety? And so, you know, they're taking a little bit of time. This is as they're warming up. So that's one type of slide. There's the stress check. Um, you can ask them a question, you know, like a, a prior knowledge question. What do you think about the topic of, right? So all kinds of really great stuff that's on here. I could go back and I could look at things I could do at the beginning of the lesson. You know, what was for homework? I like this way. Uh, this is always kind of fun. Again, you know, depending on how much time you have and so forth. But sometimes I would just do a quick little, Tell me two things you uh, you enjoy, right? Two things that make you happy. And so they could draw it or type it. And so sometimes we do a quick little Pictionary. This is great for my ELD students, my ELD classes. We're working on vocabulary. And we're talking about, oh, yeah, that's a pizza. Oh, yeah, yeah, they like swimming, right? Working all that vocabulary in a fun way. So again, these are already made. So, okay, I'm going to keep going. So here's my agenda. And let's say I want them to, to answer this. But instead of having them write it on paper, right, I'm gonna say I want them to just write it on here. So I'm gonna go back and I'm going to use uh, one of these options here. So let's say I want them to actually summarize this and put in a little text box. So I'm gonna do here and I'll show you what that looks like for a student view in a moment. And so it does something like this and down below it'll tell me, okay, this is an interactive slide. Right, so now the students are able to answer on this. The cool thing about Pear Deck is you don't have to submit, you have to hit save, it automatically saves everything. Okay, so let's say here I am going over my school policies and the students are doing this and they're not really even paying attention because I'm talking too much. So what I want them to do is I'm gonna say, okay, we're gonna read this, you're gonna read it with your partner and you're gonna highlight which one's the most, two of the most important policies in my class. So then I'm gonna click on the draw and that one's gonna let them highlight, underline, and so forth. So now I'm making this, you know, using some Kagan strategies, collaboration strategies, you're gonna to have to talk to your partner, come to a consensus, and then highlight uh, one of the top, you know, one of the, the policies here. Again, getting them engaged in the writing, you're not having them just be passive listeners. So that's what one of the things I would do. Here's another one, you know, they would listen to this poem. Maybe I print it out, maybe I can post on one of the slides, the actual lines from the poem. I can have them again, do some highlighting. And here, again, maybe I want them to type their answer onto this. So I left these lines here. And so I'm gonna click on here on draw. And one of the options that you'll see in a moment is that students can type in answers. They don't have to always draw. All right, so that's again, uh, how I might create a, this kind of a template, this kind of lesson. Let's see what it looks like. So let's say I'm ready to present this. I'm gonna to go to start lesson. And the great thing here is you can choose to either they can follow your pace 
And this is great because you can actually add new interactive slides as you're going. So let's say you're teaching and you're noticing that they're not quite getting it. You might all of a sudden want them to summarize like what they know. And so you can find a quick template, add it, and it'll, it'll add it automatically. If you do the student pace, whatever you decide as your slides, those are pretty much permanent. The great thing though about student pace is differentiation. Students can go at their own pace. If some students need more time with it, they can do it for homework. So I kind of like the student paste one a little bit more, but let's go ahead and just do the teacher paste one. All right, different ways that you can get your students to log on. And the way that you would have them log on is A, either provide the link that you're going to get or have them just very simple on their computers. They're gonna go to joinpd.com and then they're gonna use this code right here, all right? So again, they're gonna go joinpd.com and then they would use this code. Don't worry about the spacing. And then they would get in. All right, so let's see what that looks like. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna go ahead and open a link. And let's see, there it is. I was gonna ask a few questions. The students would use their school email. I always ask, I like, you know, how are you feeling? So I could do a quick little check. So I can go there. It's going to ask me again, which account do I want to use, right? So I think I had already logged on. So that's why it already didn't ask me. Okay, so there I am. And now I'm here, right? And because my teacher hasn't moved forward, it's still going to show me this slide. Okay, so let's go here. Uh, I said I wanted them to answer this question, right? So this is what the student would see. Take a look at these options, right? So here I can write, I can highlight, I can draw, underline, and I can do this text message, right? And I'm going to say what's filling my bucket. Uh, oh, my kids, right? They just went to homecoming and I was really happy to see them all dressed up, right? What's draining me? Oh, it's been a little too hot. Like we're, we're already in September and it's still very hot, right? So the heat. Okay, so I could do that. Um, I can change the size, right? Same thing with the highlighting. I could change the size here if I wanted to highlight something. All right, and I could undo it and so forth. All right, let's keep going. So I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna move my students. So they're moving along, right? They're drawing, they're doing this. Okay, here on this slide, remember that we said they were going to type in their answer. So here's that text box. They can write in their answers, right? Uh, let's go back here. Let's say I have, uh, I want them to read this and highlight it, right? So uh, there I am, okay, I can highlight things, okay? Again, I can make this a little smaller so I'm not highlighting too much, oh, right? So there you go, okay, I gotta work on having a steady hand. But one of the things I want to call your attention to is on your dashboard, there is a place where you can turn on immersive reader. So let's play for a second on that. I'm gonna click immersive reader. It is such a powerful tool if you haven't used immersive reader. So here's my immersive reader. Let's take a look at the different things you could do. So let's say I have students who are newcomers. They're still beginning English learners. I'm gonna have them click on their reading preferences. And I'm gonna change the language. I have a lot of students who speak Spanish. I'm gonna go down here to Spanish. And that ready is gonna blow your mind away. It'll read it to them. You could slow it down. Okay, I'm gonna change the whole document. So it's not just the word, I'm gonna change the whole document. And now it is in their language so they can hear it. Remember, if I'm not teaching them how to read yet, I'm just teaching them content, then it's okay for them to read it in their own language as a support, right? Let's hear Políticas de clase. Este curso está diseñado para prepararlo para el trabajo en... I can slow it down. So if I wanna slow down the, the speed, right? Um, I could change, right, uh, the font. What else? Um, here's some other cool stuff, right? So I could change the size. Um, let's say I'm teaching some grammar and I really want my students to find out where the verbs are at. So then I could do that and it'll highlight all the verbs. Let's say I want them to find out about the nouns. So here's gonna treat all the nouns. This is amazing, right? So instead of having them do worksheets all the time, Get them on Immersive Reader, uh, so much more. And again, think about all the benefits to students who are struggling with reading, struggling with their language skills. So, so again, that's a little bit of uh, Pear Deck and using that Immersive Reader. All right, and so again, you know, you can play with this. It is, uh, you know, free. 
uh, if you're in our district, you get that premium, uh, you know, site. Uh, you know, as you can go here, and if I were to go to, let's see if I could get to my dashboard. Okay, so let me find, finalize it with this. So let's say I'm done. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn in this session. And the cool thing is, it's going to say, okay, what do you want to call it? I'm going to call it my practice part of you. And I'm going to save it. And then this is another great little thing. If you go to, you can copy and send this email to your students so they can see their own responses. Or I like this one, open, reflect and review. And now let's say I want to see how little Johnny did on his slides. I'm going to look for the student. Ah, oh, there is a student. I could see all of their responses. How did they do? Did they answer all of them? Right, so I could do that. Also, I can export the information. So if I go to, let's see here, back, I go to export to a spreadsheet, I can do that. And what it'll do is it'll give me this um, Excel spreadsheet with all of their answers. So let's say they're working on writing an intro paragraph. I will have a copy of all of their intro paragraphs. So if I had them writing, you would see all of it right here, all right? So lots and so much grace. And look at how much I've, I've been using this for a good while. I do all kinds of lessons. Um, definitely a lifesaver when I was teaching uh, distance learning. So that's pretty much it uh, for this um, session here. This was reading strategies. Um, a couple of the ones that I'm going to mention, I'm not going to go into too much, but there's another program called Reading Progress. And that's this one here. This is through your Microsoft Outlook. And, um, you know, since I'm a consultant for the district, you can email me, make an appointment. I can help you set this up. But basically, it's a fluency checker. And students would use their computers. They would record a passage that you upload or you, you can use the library that they have. And within seconds, really, you get this data. You get to see how well they are reading. Can they pronounce words and so forth? My students use this like a video game because I would give them their, their uh, data and then they would say, can I read it again? When else can you do you hear high school students, middle school students saying, can I read it again? <laughs> right? And it became a little bit of a competition. Uh, what else do we have? It gives them a little reading uh, coach. So it tells them which words they need to practice. If you use the, the bank, it tells you the lexile levels of each of those passages. Uh, a couple other features that I talked about in my workshop is you know, giving students choices, as we said. And so we have a digital library called Sora and students can borrow books from there. Uh, also in our own uh, curriculum study sync, you know, if you go into the library, digital library, you'll see that they also have graphic novels that kids can use. Uh, and finally, you know, I talk about making your classes interactive. It doesn't always have to be on the computer. I love using Kagan strategies. So having students, you know, work with a partner, um, you know, that think, pair, share, work in a small group where everybody has a role. All right, so here we are to this page that I always like to leave uh, everyone with, and that is a choice board for you. All of these are things I have used in my own classroom, and I'm telling you, I had very little discipline issues because my classes were always engaging in dialogue and conversation, and I honored their ideas, and we were learners in this environment. I was not the one who knew it all and they knew that and they were sometimes they were the ones teaching me so hopefully you know this is a benefit to you uh thank you so much for listening in and i will be doing some more of these so make sure to uh, keep a lookout for other videos thank you and have a great rest of the week